of video to thank our sponsors really quick, uh, which means I'm going to stop sharing your screen. Yes, yeah, okay. Uh, it's done. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you all so much for joining us for another session. It's great to see you all, and it's so great to see Dr. Zach Constant here with us today. He's the outreach coordinator for the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams, which is the number one nuclear accelerator in the world. He is an amazing person and is very enthusiastic about outreach. It is really his passion. I'm so excited to hear more from him. Thank you so much for joining us today, Zach. Uh, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Chelsea. Uh, greetings to everybody. Uh, good morning where I am, where you are. Who knows? But that's fine. Uh, it's, it is exciting to be able to do this kind of thing, uh, talking to people uh, anywhere. Uh, and of course, we all have a lot of things in common. And one of my favorite ones is, of course, uh, passion for science. Uh, and I know a lot of people who have uh, who are busy doing important work and they want to share their work with other people. And, you know, it's just a matter of like, how does one go about doing that? And so uh, I'm pretty lucky in that my job is outreach full-time. I do public education, informal education. Uh, I am communicating with the public what happens at the facility for rare isotope beams right there, FRIB. We are a nuclear research laboratory on the campus of Michigan State University. And it's a major grant funded uh, laboratory that, you know, you know, people are paying for. <laughs> and it's important for people to know why, what are we doing? Uh, and, you know, we, we really wanna get that across to our neighbors, you know, our community uh, and anybody really who is interested. Uh, so, uh, that's my full-time job, and I've spent a lot of time doing this. Of course, my my background is I, I ended up with a PhD in physics. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do with that, you know, degree. And I, you know, after trying a few different things, I kind of lucked into this job. Didn't really know that you could do this job. Um, so, it, it, like I said, it's it's lucky. I it's nice that I can do this on a permanent basis. However, the vast majority of people who are going to do outreach about science, research, whatever, uh, you know, it's not their full-time work. And so, you know, it's it's going to be a, a bigger challenge. And so why would you, you know, why would you know how to do everything, right? Well, of course, that's why I'm here to talk to you. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I have a lot of really great advice, I think. Hopefully, it'll be very useful to you. Uh, and, you know, let's get started, shall we? There we go. So uh, if you haven't seen The Wizard of Oz, which came out in uh, you know, the early part of the 20th century, uh, you should probably catch up. You should, you should do it. Uh, it's, a, it's a good movie. And I just enjoy uh, the, using this example uh, to talk about how we present ourselves as scientists. Uh, and so you know, I don't want to give away too much, but I, like I said, it's, the movie's been around a long time, so I'm going to spoil a few things. Uh, you know, you come to a room and you see uh, fire and, you know, weird lighting and, and this giant floating head, you know. And so, you know, this is one way to present science, that it's, it's, it's this incredible endeavor that is, uh, you know, all-knowing and all-seeing. Um, so this is one way to, to express oneself uh, as a scientist. Of course, uh, it's important to look at this and say, well, you know, what is the message we are sending with this? Uh, how, what kind of impressions does this give the audience? How does it make them feel? Uh, and if, if you want to su make suggestions, you can just throw them in the chat. You can just say, how does this make you feel at this point? Uh, we, we, if you came into a room and you saw this, um, what would be your reaction? Just curious. I've got my own ideas, but I want to see if you match. Horrified. Ah, oh, that's excellent. <laughs> this, this is obviously meant to be intimidating. Absolutely is confused. What is going on here? 
why do they have giant balls of flame? It's an excellent question. Uh, this is good. So uh, it's it's strange. It's definitely not normal. Uh, it's mysterious. Definitely intimidating. Uh, it is impressive, though. That's nice, right? So yes, we want uh, science to be impressive, but maybe not off-putting, maybe not intimidating to the audience. We're trying to, outreach, of course, is about communicating with people, you know, outside of your own field to, you know, educate. And this might not be the best way. Uh, so the, of course, again, giving away too much about the movie, uh, all that amazing stuff was actually one guy behind a curtain uh working his gears and wheels and things uh and of course he says pay no attention to the man behind the curtain but of course we're talking about science outreach so to the scientist now uh when you see this gentleman instead uh just curious how does that make you feel what what impressions do you get uh from from this kind of presentation No suggestions. Oh, here we go. Repeat the question. Certainly, certainly. So, uh, if this was if this was what you saw instead of the previous amazing flaming death, uh, <laughs> what would what are, what are your impressions uh, when when you see this kind of thing? How does it make you feel? That's the question about this image. Scientists in action, right? So like, he's clearly doing something. It does kind of look like an autoclave, I suppose. That's great. Uh, comfortable. That's yeah, this is really good. This is really good. Uh, it does look awfully complicated, but it is interesting, relatable, right? So this is something I can relate to as opposed to a floating alien head. Uh, it's more human. And this is an important point. Um, and, we'll, and this comes up a lot. The general public has an impression of scientists. Uh, and sometimes it can be they are this, <clears throat> you know, giant brain, very different people off at a far distance, uh, and we don't relate to them. They're not like us. Uh, you know, we can't we can't communicate and connect. Uh, but we don't want to, you know, and reinforce that idea, of course. And so misconceptions, of course, is a big deal, and and you want to try and fight those any way you can. Uh, but, you know, you see this guy, and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's a guy. I can get it. So point is, uh, we're trying to reach people. Uh, and that's what science outreach does. We can, we're making that connection with other humans. Of course, it's a great thing to do because it really helps uh, you in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, it's a great way to, sh to show people that what you're doing is important and get them excited about it, which is really important because uh, the more people who are you know, interested and supportive of your work, the better off you're going to be. Uh, of course, you are going to be helping out those people as well. That's nice. Uh, but to be honest, you know, it's, it's really important to remember, you know, when you think about outreach, people often think of it as a very, um, you know, as, as a way to help others. And that is absolutely true, but it absolutely does help yourself. Uh, it really does make a lot of difference for the volunteers who are doing the outreach as much as for the community itself. Absolutely important to remember. Uh, so if you're going to do this work, science outreach, uh, you need to think about, uh, you know, well, you got to answer a lot of questions. Who is your audience? And I did put up a poll for that, of course, before the talk. And I have a lot of great answers here. Uh, just some suggestions, some points, general public, students, educators, researchers, and professionals. Uh, this person's talking about a lot of different audiences. Uh, they want to get their information out there. That's great. Um, communities directly impacted by my work. That's a great audience that you want to communicate with. Uh, you want them to understand what you're doing and why. Uh, students, obviously. Other scientists, great. You know, it's, it's important for them to know uh, what you're doing so that you maybe can work together. Uh, there's a lot of potential collaboration there. Funders, oh, that's a good answer. Uh, we want them to know what we're doing and why. Farmers and consumers, they got a specific audience that they're trying to reach. That's great. School kids, sure, you betcha. So there's a lot of different options, right? A lot of different kinds of people. And you have to think about 
who are you going to be talking to? Uh, that's going to obviously help you get that message across. And of course, then once you know what your who your audience is, what will you do for your audience? Uh, there's a lot of different possibilities. We'll talk about those. Uh, what will they tell their friends and family? So I don't know if you've run into this concept of an elevator speech before, uh, but the idea is uh, if you're meeting somebody in an elevator and you only have a few seconds, uh, they ask you what you do and you have a few seconds to express it. Uh, you need to make it, you know, short and sweet and and understandable. Uh, so, you know, um, for our laboratory, the elevator speech that I give, uh, FRIB is the name of our lab, is a world leader at smashing nuclei and studying the pieces. And that's true. That's what we do. And it's something that's memorable uh, and, you know, gets the point across, uh, but, you know, doesn't give too much de detail, definitely doesn't have too much, uh, you know, strange terminology you know this is the kind of thing we're trying to get the point across uh and of course anything that you can explain to them uh people who interact with you maybe later on can talk to others right so they can be spreading your message that's why your message has to be memorable and simple <laughs> and easy to communicate uh this is important when i got this job right i had a phd in physics i'd been in academia a long time and i really wanted to uh you know communicate nuclear science uh, especially to students. I wanted to teach them everything I thought was going to be great. I had done some teaching and I loved it. Uh, but uh, I very quickly learned that, you know, in informal education, uh, you don't generally have people, you know, for very long. You don't have a lot of opportunity to, to communicate with them. So it's, it's not a class. You're just not going to teach them many things. So how will, you know, you have to think about what you uh, can do. Again, a simple message, uh, and maybe especially how the, the the science that you're talking about relates specifically to them, because obviously that's very meaningful for your audience. Um, how can you make a long term impact? You know, we're we're opening people's eyes to what we what we do, right? Uh, and it can be quite amazing for people who didn't know about that in advance. Uh, and so you know they they realize the world is bigger than it was a minute ago, and. And uh, maybe it gives them an idea that, that they want to interact with, with your work in some way further in the future. That's great. Uh, the big one for me always is going to be change attitudes. And that's what we really can do in outreach. You're not generally teaching people content. Uh, obviously, you can in introduce them to a lot of things, but they're probably not going to keep it. Obviously, one of the great things about out outreach is that there are no tests. There's no homework uh, that makes people feel a lot more comfortable, but you can change their attitudes and that's wonderful, right? So they might come in thinking uh, or not thinking about your work at all. And then they can come away saying, oh, that's really important and interesting. I'm glad those people are doing that. Uh, that is a really great outcome, which we are aiming for with outreach. So let me tell you a little bit more about our work, our specific laboratory and our outreach goals. Um, our laboratory is, of course, funded by uh, with currently the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Science, but also uh, the National Science Foundation. And so uh, they have requirements that we have to you know, do some what we call broader impacts, which is, of course, uh, includes things like publishing papers, <laughs> which is, a, is important. We're trying to get the information that we learn out. But, of course, outreach is another way to do that, and that's really good. So we're trying to create awareness of our laboratory. Uh, we are a building in the middle of the Michigan State University campus. Uh, people generally don't have a reason to come in here or know what we're doing. So we're trying to communicate with our community and the world, uh, you know, to know that we're doing what we do and why. And of course we want them to be uh, happy that we're doing that. And so we want them to understand what are the, what are the applications and benefits? Like, how, how is this going to help us? Because it is that matters, of course, to the audience. Uh, and, you know, if we do introduce a lot of younger students to this kind of work, they may decide that they're interested and want to pursue that in the future. So where are we going to get future nuclear scientists? Uh, we're trying to make them. That's an important part of our work in outreach at EFRIB. So we have a lot of different things you can do. And, you know, I'm not going to go all through all these things, but the idea is we have, our audience is global. We are trying to reach lots and lots of people, you know, but of course, 
reaching different people you know, requires different techniques. Uh, of course, I run a lot of tours of our laboratory. Well, obviously that's only gonna be effective for people who are in the community or nearby. <laughs> they have to be willing to travel here. Uh, but I love giving tours of our laboratory, but that reaches a fairly narrow audience for a, a relatively short time. Um, but we can reach other audiences uh, with our website and a video game and all kinds of things. Uh, so there's there's a lot of different things you can do. And of course, we, so every once in a while we'll have an open house. We'll open, you know, and and let people come in. Uh, we got four thousand people one day. <laughs> uh, it, it was it was ridiculous. And our lab is not a theme park. We're not set up to handle thousands of people, but uh, people get excited and when they have an opportunity to see something they, they might not have otherwise. And, you know, this is a great way for us to communicate our work to people. So lots and lots of different ways to do this. And it varies from a very large audience, uh, but maybe very minimal interaction down to uh, a very small audience with very intensive interaction like camps where we bring in students for an entire week and they get to really experience what it is to be a nuclear scientist. So lots and lots of different ways to do this. And, you know, you have to con consider, like, like I said, that's my full-time job. I don't expect you to do all these things, uh, but you and maybe your colleagues uh, can put together uh, a few options for people to interact with. Uh, we're like I said, we're trying to recruit future nuclear scientists, so we have a variety of ways. Uh, and you notice that we're starting to talk to students about nuclear science at uh, you know in their younger years, you know, in their elementary school years. Uh, so maybe they're 10, 11, 12 years old. It's important to remember this. If you can reach students young, you know, by the time they get to high school, it's often true that a student has a pretty good idea of what they're interested in or not interested in, and, you know, has some sort of goal for their career. So if you can get them early, then maybe you can influence uh, their, their interests. Uh, and it, just you have to introduce them to something they might not have thought of before. And then they say, oh, okay, well, maybe I want to pursue that idea. Uh, so we have lots and lots of things from very young age all the way through graduate school. Uh, and, you know, I can tell you it's working. You know, uh, Evangeline asked, asked earlier, you know, how do we know, you know, our impact? Uh, one way that we do is I track students who go through these camps. And, um, and at the very least, I can tell you how many of them are currently attending Michigan State University. Uh, there's 14 undergraduates and three graduate students here at the university uh, and that are coming for, out of my camps and they are almost exclusively majoring in physics so you know and so that that's great of course we do always hear from students who talk you know and they come back and they talk and they say oh you know having that experience really helped me because it, it opened my eyes to a, a new field that i might be interested in and i i pursued it so I've met, you know, hundreds of students, students over the years who were now suddenly disco discovering that, oh, this is an exciting thing. Uh, and a very minor interaction, maybe, you know, they came and took a tour or we saw them at the science festival or who knows, and that started them on a path that they just wouldn't have expected. But now they're pursuing physics. And a lot of them are doing nuclear, so... <laughs> excuse me so yes you can make future scientists it is possible and that's a it's pretty exciting uh so i another poll that i asked before the uh before this event was you know what kinds of things have you done and or are interested in doing like i said we have a lot of different things here at our laboratory uh people are you know people made some suggestions in the poll um, community awareness program about diseases are uh, excellent. Okay, get get out there in the community. Uh, capacity development training, nice. Help farmers with their agriculture. Uh, it's a great impact, obviously. Public lecture, it's pretty simple. It's something that almost you know anybody can do. Uh, you know, it's just got to be willing to get up and talk in front of an audience. Of course, that's really useful experience if you can get it because the more you can talk about it in front of people, the, the better you'll get. Uh, environmental advocacy, excellent. 
uh, capacity building, conferences, workshops. So there's a lot of different ways you can do this and you need to consider what you're, what you're willing to do, what you're able to do. Uh, you would be surprised what you are capable of. Uh, so, and, and of course, right now, I, uh, it's important for us to think about ways that we can reach audiences uh, at a distance. It's wonderful that we have Zoom and other tools uh, to, to reach these audiences. So uh, that means we can reach a lot more people than we normally would. So keep that in mind as you are thinking about what you want to do. Now, here's one of my best pieces of advice. I've been here at this laboratory for 16 years, and uh, I've my goal is, all that time has been to communicate nuclear research uh, to audiences. And uh, thankfully, being here at the university in this community, I have met a lot of interesting people who do a lot of interesting things. And so, for instance, uh, I ran into some video game developer students here at MSU, and I said, hey, you make video games. Uh, we have a really cool subject, nuclear research. Uh, we should make a video game. Of course, it did take, you know, pulling together quite a bit of funds, but we were able to make a video game about our laboratory. It's called Isotopolis. You can download it now. You can play it right now. We have, uh, as far as I know, over 40,000 students who have, or people who have played this game worldwide uh, in the time that it's been available. And, uh, you know, these, uh, it's worldwide. So we are now reaching a lot of people who never would have heard of us and that we otherwise could not get to. Uh, so that's great that they're learning about what we're doing. Uh, but again, so like they had a skill making video games that I absolutely did not have, uh, but I had interesting content to share. So it was possible for them uh, and me in our laboratory to combine our efforts and do something that neither of us could do individually, right? So partnering with other people who are experts in some other sort of field, and especially some sort of uh, communications, uh, it's really, really, really useful. So uh, we, of course, have worked with other groups here on campus uh, to run summer camps about nuclear science. Uh, we we now have a, a show that we can do over at the planetarium across the street. Uh, we can do a show about our laboratory there as well. Uh, there is a science museum here in town that now has an exhibit about our laboratory. Uh, they have 150,000 students per year visiting that. Uh, and so that's a whole lot of, of kids that would maybe never have, would have known about our laboratory, but now they're being exposed uh, to what we do. And of course, that's their expertise, right? They're the science museum for students. They're really, really great at, at making hands-on activities for kids to learn about different subjects. And we had a great subject. And they, you know, so combining our expertise with theirs uh, created this wonderful, wonderful uh, exhibit. What a shot love. You should go see it. Uh, my favorite one, of course, recently is we, we had a dance performance about nuclear science in uh, November of last year. So, um, hey, let's tell our story through dance. We're definitely going to reach some new audiences that way. <laughs> and we did. Chelsea danced, by the way. She's right there. Yes, uh, she was dancing. It was fantastic. I actually got a chance to dance a little bit as well, uh, but it was uh, it was a really great way to to reach our community and and help them understand what we were doing. It was really fun. So lots and lots of ways. So you should be thinking about right who who could you work with, what partnerships you know who do you know, <laughs> uh, and and maybe do they have audiences that you want to. Uh, you know, communicate with already, right? So if they, you know, like I said, this local science museum was already reaching a lot of students. Uh, we can absolutely leverage what they have uh, already, and you know, and, and and get our word to a much larger audience. Wonderful. So that's what you need to be thinking about. And I did ask uh, this question to Paul, like, who, uh, what partners might collaborate with you to communicate? your science to your design and audience and you know people named universities absolutely uh uh government health officials ah this is great you, you can work with those people uh researchers other scientists content creators that's a good one right so there's a lot of uh really really interesting uh people were on youtube and other places who are communicating science already they have a large audience 
we've talked to a few in the past. Uh, so there's there's a lot of ways to uh, you know work with them and and hopefully you know get your audience get their audience something about your information, which is really really great. So there's a lot of ways to do this. Look for collaborations. It's my best advice, honestly. Uh, now, of course, I love informal learning, right? Formal learning, you're in a class, uh, you're generally being graded. That can be an issue. Informal learning is, uh, this is for fun. You're not going to get graded. Uh, and we're going to, you know, introduce you to something interesting, right? And of course, usually we try to keep it hands-on, uh, you know, so it's not so much with the textbooks, which is good. Uh, and of course, audiences, the general public especially, really respond well to informal learning because of those reasons. Uh, it's 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 something that they're curious about doing, they're interested in doing, maybe not something they have to do because it's a class. Uh, and, you know, they're, <laughs> they're generally just more comfortable with that kind of thing. So uh, that's why one of the reasons MSU started its own science festival is because we'd seen how successful that had been at other locations around the world. And we realized that we could, you know, draw in a very large audience. Uh, we get, you know, over 10,000 people every year uh, to under, just to explore what's going on in science at Michigan State University. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. So um, it's, it's a great opportunity. You want to you make sure you are getting people involved. And of course, they won't be tested. So that's kind of fun. Uh, I, I did mention this before, but I want to give you a very specific example. So what uh, outreach can do for the audience, right? We're not teaching them the material. We are changing attitudes. We are, you know, helping them realize uh, that this is interesting and can be valuable to them. Uh, so we did actually did a, a study uh, and I worked with people from the MSU College of Education, right? Again, partnerships. I'm a physicist. I don't have experience, <laughs> you know, giving surveys and analyzing the data and that kind of thing. Uh, but the people in College of Education did. So uh, they created that survey for me and analyzed it. And so they were able to say, okay, let's look at the uh, the feelings of our audience before they interacted with, uh, you know, outreach from EFRIB. And so these are the kinds of feelings that people had. Curiosity, that's great. Anticipation, concern, intimidation, confusion. You know, people can be very intimidated by science because they feel like they don't know anything, and so they don't, they they can't understand how they would know anything. You know, it's it's not possible because it's not for me. I was never good at science. You know that kind of thing, uh, and that's a misconception we want to fight because, you know, that just because it didn't come easily to them doesn't mean they can't understand it. Um, you know, so their experience in a classroom may be very different, of course, than what they see in informal learning. Uh, bewilderment, disinterest, people might just not be interested at all. Uh, so this is this is the thing. Uh, science can pre present, people may have the wrong impression of science, and, and that's why I showed you those pictures at the beginning. Uh, but of course, after they came out of our experiences and it was a variety of different things the kinds of attitudes that people expressed afterwards were amazement interest excitement inspiration fantastic enthusiasm and gratitude this is a fantastic result right this is what we're looking for uh, we want people to uh, have their eyes opened and their mind opened uh, to the work that we do so this is what you can accomplish uh, and you should be doing it it'd be great uh, this is a really good example of how uh, people, after they've been inspired, uh, you know, I get a lot of uh, thank you notes from from kids, and you know, so they come and they they learn about nuclear research at our laboratory, and they send us these pictures. Like, so somebody's clearly a My Little Pony fan. Great, right? But but you know, they were so interested in what we did that they drew a My Little Pony. Uh, with you can't really see it, but they've got a little symbol of an atom on the back there. So uh, they are now incorporating our work and what we do into their own interests and combining it with their own interests. My Little Pony, nuclear My Little Pony, figure that one out if you can. Nuclear Dragon over here. This is a great one. I love this one, right? Uh, and you know, here's a kid with a, a, a shirt that let's get scientific. Right? How do you express your excitement about something? You wear a T-shirt. That's the way it is. Uh, so, it's it's just wonderful to see uh, that 
the kids come out and they're and they're happy and they're interested. So uh, that's another way to tell that you're doing something good. So if we're going to change attitudes, uh, why is that important? Well, of course, we're, we want the people who are voting and paying taxes to understand why we do what we do and the value thereof. Uh, and of course, our laboratory has a lot of different outreach uh, opportunities, but we generally don't have to advertise at all. Really, word of mouth from people who have interacted with us in the past, they talk to their friends, they, their friends decide they want to come. That's mostly how we get uh, contacts uh, with, with people who are interested in learning more about what goes on. Uh, of course, we do use the MSU Science Festival and other ways to communicate with audiences, but a lot of them is are just, they've heard from somebody else that it was interesting. Uh, this is a really big one. Uh, science from the outside can be a black box. It is a little scary because you're not sure what they're doing, especially when the word nuclear is attached. <laughs> People uh, sometimes are a little scared of our laboratory. And so I want them to know that there's nothing to be scared of. Uh, and so just anything that is unknown is certainly going to be scarier than what is known and understood. So that's really good. Uh, of course, like I said, we can recruit new scientists, young young people to go into science. Uh, we did do a study, again, with the uh, MSU College of Education. Uh, they studied students coming out of our uh, summer camps, and they realized that compared to their peers, the students who attended our camps were far more likely to major in a STEM field, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and far more likely to go into a career in one of those fields. Uh, so it was wonderful to see uh, that their attitudes were changed, that they like, oh, you know what, this is something for me. Uh, you know, if they come out and they say this is not for me, great. But a lot of students decide that this is an exciting field and they want to explore it more. And they do. So now that you're fully <laughs> convinced that is a very good idea to do outreach, uh, it is challenging, of course, because you're trying to communicate generally something that might be very technical and, and specialized and unusual to an audience that doesn't see that kind of thing very often. Uh, so, you know, when I do outreach to the public, I often have a wide range of ages. <laughs> you know, how are you going to communicate to kids and adults at the same time? Uh, and maybe some of them know way more than others or, you know, don't know anything, who knows? Uh, and of course, they're not familiar with the terminology that is involved in that particular field. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of misconceptions that we're dealing with. It's a challenging job, right? And of course, keeping them engaged, right? So um, we don't want them to go away saying, well, science is boring. <laughs> we, that's the exact opposite of the goal. Uh, so you know, how are we gonna how are we gonna keep them involved? So it's it's very different from formal learning. Obviously, we're not gonna sit them in the classroom and and have them study and take tests. Uh, we really want to do this in different ways to make sure that we're reaching the audience appropriately uh, and keeping them engaged. So how do we do it? Uh, you know, if you're gonna deal with people with uh, different ages and, and, and learning ability and, and, and knowledge base, you've got to communicate in lots of different ways. Uh, and so we have, I always have lots of physical models and activity to do uh, while having wonderful imagery and you know, using very specific examples that they can relate to, right? You gotta, um, and so I, I love making references uh, to children's movies that people will know because that will help them. Anything you can do to latch on to some knowledge that they already have. And that can be just, uh, you know, a movie that they've seen in the past. Uh, it's really important to communicate with the public, especially uh, not in the same way that you would communicate with a scientist. <laughs> Uh, obviously, uh, you know, they're just not used to that kind of language and it's not a class, which is important. Uh, anyway, so you incorporate a lot of different uh, kinds of communication and you try to keep it simple. It's, like I said, you got to have your elevator speech. How are you going to say what you need to say quickly and simply? Uh, and you're it's important to realize, you know, you're not necessarily going to reach everyone. Some people might not catch on to it. There's only so much you can do. So it's okay. Uh, it's okay to, you know, really try to reach 
uh, the lower level knowledge base. And if somebody knows more, you know, they will often ask questions, which is great because they're paying attention. Uh, I always appreciate when that happens. Um, I always try to remind people to say it's okay to say you don't know. And that's an important part of science is that we don't know. And that's why we're doing this work. Uh, you know, people sometimes get the idea that uh, scientists are supposed to have all the answers. And if they don't, uh, what good are they? <laughs> so, you know, we, we want to make sure that uh, we're showing that, yes, you know, we're, we have problems too that we're trying to solve. And it's, but it's important for us to keep it at it, really. Uh, I mentioned this before, but like anything you can do to communicate how this work is impacting them specifically. Uh, that is wonderful. In in nuclear science, I always relate to uh, medical technologies that have come out of it. Uh, you know, so there are certain medical imaging technologies uh, that are originally nuclear detectors. You can diagnose certain illnesses by injecting the patient with radioactive isotopes. Uh, we treat cancer with particle accelerators that were invented for nuclear research. So there's a lot of things that you know that people may have some personal experience with, right? That they've had to have some sort of medical process, uh, procedure and maybe they were injected with radioactive material or at least know somebody who went into an MRI machine, right? And they can say, oh, okay, uh, you know, nuclear science did this for that patient, for you maybe, which is wonderful. I don't, you know, so analogies that, that connect to common experiences, that's what we're looking for. Uh, and of course, things that, um, things that are simple and can communicate uh, what we want to do uh, in a way that is relatable. Uh, I just like showing, let's see if we can get this. Okay, so this is my model nucleus. I spend a lot of time explaining nuclei to people and they will never see them. So I just have to have something physical that they can look at and interact with. Uh, of course, the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons. And uh, here at Michigan State, our colors are green and white. So all nuclei are now green and white. Nobody can prove me wrong. Anyway, so it's just really useful. I, I, I'm glad that I came up with this particular demonstration, this uh, example, uh, because it's just so much easier for people to relate to, um, no matter how much they know about uh, nuclear science or don't. So, uh, you know, think about it. See, Think about what you can come up with along those lines. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, there's some serious issues um, when it comes to the general public and science, uh, because when people in, you know, people outside the laboratory, when they use the word theory, uh, they are usually talking about guesses. <laughs> I have a theory, you know, like, well, okay. Uh, they don't necessarily understand uh, what theory means and its significance in science. And so it's very important for them to know because when you talk about the theory of evolution, for instance, uh, they that their interpretation of the word theory might lessen the impact of how successful that particular theory is. It's not a guess. It's a really excellent explanation of what we see and understand. Uh, and it's been tested time and again. And, you know, so anyway, um, but I suppose, uh, another really, really important way to get get to people, even when they're a little overwhelmed by what you've got, is they can always relate to other people. And so when I have uh, recruit scientists from this laboratory to talk to them, you know, I always remind them, share your story, right? Like, how did you end up in this place? You know, why are you doing what you do? Uh, because that will help the, the audience to realize, oh, okay, they're a person like me, and maybe I can see myself in that, that role as well. Uh, and talk about, you know, scientists are normal people. Talk about your hobbies. <laughs> you know, help them understand uh, that they can relate to you, right? That you are not that different. That's always a great way to, to, to make that connection with the, uh, the audience. Um, I always send my audience home with something. So I have lots of free paper to give out, stickers, you know, that kind of stuff, because uh, that will remind them longer term of that interaction with uh, your outreach. And then maybe they'll choose to interact with you again in the future because they have that reminder. Uh, highly recommended. Give them something that they can take away. Uh, I kind of alluded to this several times, but there are a lot of misconceptions. You know, the, 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 the word theory, for instance, right? Uh, the idea that scientists are, you know, a, a very specific kind of person. 
you know, so uh, people have done studies here, uh, you know, and, and so a good example that I love to quote, um, uh, people did a study where they had young students draw a scientist and they drew a man, you know, with glasses, maybe bald, <laughs> and lab coat, you know, uh, probably white skinned, you know, and they're like, oh, that's because that's just their impression. And that could have come from uh, media or whatnot. Uh, and so they had them draw that. And then they had the students meet a bunch of real scientists. And, you know, and they just, of course, those scientists were not all the same kind of person. There were lots of different kinds of people. Uh, and then they had the students draw a scientist again, just draw a scientist. And the students drew themselves, or at least somebody who looked like themselves. Right, because even if they hadn't met somebody who looked exactly like them or was exactly like them in you know in, in those experiences, uh, they realized that you know they could be like those people that they were not a different sort of people. They were like me. I could be like them. Anyway, so uh, you want to make sure you show the diversity of scientists uh, and how we are relatable, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, I, I often have to deal with um, misconceptions like, you know, because I work in a nuclear research lab. So people want to know if we glow in the dark, it's really important to address those kinds of questions because they might be making a joke, but not everybody will necessarily uh, realize that it's a joke. Uh, and so you have to you know, make it clear that uh, safety is not something we mess around with. Uh, I mentioned before, a lot of people just think, Oh, I'm not a scientist, or I can't do science. I was, I was never, was never good at it as a kid, uh, you know, and I never understand anything. So I'll just not worry about it, right? I won't, I won't interact with it. Uh, we need people to realize that it's, you know, it's not something that they can never be a part of, you know. Not, not even that they have to be a scientist or research, but like uh, they can be the part of the community and interact with scientists, and and it's okay. Right. So, and especially for younger people, I always try to show them that there's lots of different possibilities in science, lots of different kinds of jobs, not just being a researcher, and that there's lots and lots of sciences they maybe never have heard of. Um, but, you know, sometimes people get the impression that, you know, you can only be a good scientist if you're just naturally good at it, right? It comes to you easily and you have no trouble. Well, obviously, that's not actually the case. Uh, what makes a really, really good scientist is not giving up <laughs> uh, because it's going to be challenging. It's always going to be challenging. So, um, you know, and so I have my uh, uh, my scientists tell their stories, right? So they'll, you know, people will assume that physicists are just naturally good at math. Uh, but I've had lots of physicists talk to my, you know, younger students in these camps and say, you know what? I never really enjoyed the math, but I'm willing to do it. Uh, because I'm really excited about the physics, you know? And so that's an important message to get across. So we don't want them to, <laughs> we don't want them to be confused. You know, uh, when you see representations of scientists in the media, uh, they can be very funny, but we probably want to try and um, convince them that that's not an accurate representation. Uh, really, the Big Bang Theory isn't it quite how scientists are. There are aspects of, of truth there, but it's not quite the same. Uh, keeping them engaged. How do we keep people engaged with what we do? Uh, definitely want to try to keep them, you know, acting, right? So you don't want to just present. I feel like I'm doing that right now. Of course, it's part of my problem. I'm trying to get through everything. That's the thing. But invite questions from your audience. Ask, ask them questions by all means. Uh, and of course, give them something to do. Uh, you know, like sometimes I'll get a hundred students for a, a presentation and um, yeah, I can't possibly have them all do something physically, but I always get lots of volunteers from the audience to come do things because even if you yourself don't get to, to, you know, play with the marbles or whatever, then maybe you get to, you're seeing somebody from your audience. So from your group uh, that I can relate to and they're doing it and it makes you feel uh, like you're relating to it in a, a better way, which is great. Uh, this is really important when you have an audience, and this is, of course, difficult over Zoom, but if you have an audience and you're talking to them, uh, it's it, it, you can train yourself to notice when they're not engaged. 
Uh, and so when I talk to students, I can see when their eyes glaze over and they're kind of checking out. And so that's the time uh, to get things interesting, you know, and that's usually when I bring out more marbles and smash them and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but this, all of this kind of relates to the final point on this slide, which is if you're going to, if you want people to be excited about what you're talking about, you have to be excited about what you're talking about. Uh, kids especially can tell if you're not interested, uh, why should I be? You know, so uh, you have to be enthusiastic about it. And, you know, of course, what we're doing is exciting stuff. So there's no reason not to be. Uh, just make sure that that comes across. Uh, however, you have to do it. You have to make you make it clear uh, the, your own excitement. So if you're going to be effective in outreach, uh, outreach, of course, is we're reaching out. We are trying to communicate uh, with a new audience. So we got to be willing to, to, to talk with people. Uh, we've got to make it easy for them to access us. Like I said, we've got a lot of people coming in uh, to our laboratory, but we also want to make it easy for people who can't do that. Uh, and so we'll go to places and we will uh, provide digital content that they can access anywhere in the world and that kind of stuff. Um, and then, of course, the, my favorite is sincerity, like just being, you know, telling them your story about why we're excited and, um, you know, that just that relationship with another human uh, really helps them um, feel like they can connect to the science. That's the, that's the thing. So how are we going to do it? Well, we need money, especially if you want to make yourself accessible, right? So uh, like I met a, a teacher who's like, well, you know, I, I, I work at this school system. We don't have a lot of money. We can't bring our students to you. Um, but we're kind of in a rural area. We can't get um, people to come to our area to talk to our students. You know, thankfully, I have funding to, to pay for travel to go there and, and talk to them about our research. You know, so sometimes you got to be willing to make that um, connection. Of course, you're going to have to find funding for that purpose. Um, you know, we're, we're lucky in that we have a wonderful laboratory that people can actually tour. Um, and so inviting people into the building uh, is a wonderful, wonderful way uh, to meet, you know, meet the needs of the audience. Uh, but of course, the most important, which I've said several times, is the humans, because we got to make that human connection with the audience. Uh, and again, it's going to help the community. It's going to help the people who do the volunteering as well. Uh, and here in the, our laboratory, we have 800 some people. I'm lucky that there are a lot of people who are willing to volunteer to do various outreach. Uh, the thing is, of course, I don't want to get the same people over and in because because anybody who's willing to do it will probably volunteer multiple times. Uh, maybe there are some people who are, are are maybe intimidated by the idea of uh, volunteering for outreach and they won't want to do it. But you should try to encourage people uh, because it's an important experience for them. Uh, and it does help the community, but it helps them as well. Um so it's important for people to realize uh, the importance of outreach, obviously. Got to get humans to do it. So recruiting volunteers, I'm working on that right now. I need volunteers for a whole lot of events this spring here in Michigan. Uh, and so the way I get my volunteers is t-shirts and food. Usually, it's the easy way, uh, especially for uh, you know undergraduate students and graduate students. They'll do almost anything for pizza. It's fantastic. Uh, but like, I'm always trying to make sure that it's attractive in that they get something. Uh, of course, most people uh, do understand the value of doing outreach. So that'll help. Uh, but I try not to ask too much of them. So we're going to have a, a two day expo event. Uh, we, we need to have booths that are staffed for six hours a day for two days. Well, that's practically a job, right? So I'm asking people to do a shift of two hours at a time. You know, uh, that's something that's that they can manage, right? If they wanna volunteer for longer than that, great. But I'm trying to make it uh, seem like it's, it's reasonable. That's the important thing. And maybe you bring a friend along and make it more fun, which is great. And we've got lots of ways to communicate with students. Uh, you always want to make sure you're, you're reaching the potential uh, the potential pool of volunteers uh, in multiple ways so they can, you know, volunteer. Uh, all right, how to improve? Yeah, so I spent 16 years doing this, and it's difficult. It is difficult work, uh, but it's fun work. 
Uh, and one of my favorite things about it is the fact that we always get to, to improve uh, because, you know, maybe we'll meet an audience and, you know, the message won't really get across well, but, you know, we can modify based on that experience. We can, and of course, that's a nice reason to get to do surveys and get information back from your audience. Uh, you know, what, what was impactful and what was not. You know, and then we can make modifications for the next time, right? So I love being able to do that, uh, to, to keep, just keep improving how we help each subsequent audience. Uh, so yeah, and, but in, in the end, there's just no way to get better at it than that is more important than just doing it over and over again. The more outreach you do, uh, the better it's gonna get for sure. Uh, and of course, now things have uh, changed a lot because we had this uh, this period where we couldn't do any in-person outreach. And so we learned how to do a virtual outreach at a distance. Uh, and so that was, a, I mean, it was awful that we didn't want people to get sick, but it was a wonderful opportunity to become very creative uh, and innovate, right? Um, necessity is the mother of invention. So uh, I suddenly was learning to reach audiences in entirely new ways. And, you know, obviously now we can continue to do that. Uh, so, you know, that's just a good example of you should try to continue to be creative uh, about the ways that you communicate with your audiences uh, because it's going to make your outreach that much better. So this pretty much sums up everything I've said. Uh, you want to make that connection between scientists and and, and your audience. Uh, for me, it's the public, but it could be a variety of audiences, uh, stakeholders, funders, other scientists. That's great. You want to make that connection. Uh, you want to make it easy for your volunteers to do it. Uh, you want to make sure your uh, message is adapted for the audience and for multiple audiences if you want to reach them. Uh, you want to find uh, other experts, collaborators that you can work with to do things that you can't do yourself. My, my biggest example for me, I have a physics background. I don't have an education background. I don't know a lot about educational theory or practice. I don't know a lot about um, assessment. That was a big one. So I found people who did and they helped me uh, and they got a paper out of it. So make them happy. Uh, make use of whatever you have, right? I've got an amazing laboratory. Uh, who knows what you have? So make use of it. Uh, try new ways to communicate. This is a really, really good one. Exceed expectations. You know, I get a lot of people coming to tour a nuclear research lab. Uh, and of course, uh, due to misconceptions on their part, they probably think that scientists are going to be very boring to talk to. Well, we, you know, we we surprise them and, and that generally makes them very happy. Uh, when people ask for things, you know, I mean, that's a good sign that they're, you're communicating with you and making requests, you know, yes, you can't fill every request, uh, but I always, almost always say yes, uh, because I want to encourage that behavior. Uh, and if I can't give them exactly what they want, I will offer something else, give them an alternative. Uh, that's really important. Close the gap. So you need to make the effort to reach uh, audiences that maybe wouldn't know to come to you or can't physically, or, you know, there's a variety of reasons why they can't get to you otherwise. Uh, but of course, you guys always want to be improving what you're doing, the way you're doing. Uh, fantastic. And that's my five minute warning. Uh, and this is the last slide from conveniently. Uh, so again, in Wizard of Oz, you know, the, the wizard who wasn't a giant floating head, he was actually just a, a guy. Uh, working the gears behind the, the scenes, you know, he turns out he doesn't have amazing powers. He can't grant wishes, uh, but he did change the lives of the people that he interacted with. And that is something that every one of you can do. And so I want to encourage you, uh, do outreach, you know, and, and learn as you go. It's not something that, uh, that you were necessarily trained to do. Hopefully I've given you some good ideas along those lines. Uh, and I will take questions for a couple minutes before they make me stop. You can put things in the chat. You can unmute whatever it is you want to do. Yeah. 
It all made perfect sense, didn't it? Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you're here to talk to. I need to have somebody to talk to. That's that's my work. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Zach. Uh, we have a few minutes before we move over to the next session. Does anyone have any questions? You can post them in the chat. You can raise your hand and unmute or Q and A, whatever you'd like. All right, excellent question here in the chat. Uh, what is a challenge you've come across with trying to find partners and getting them to partner? Uh, and how have you overcome that? So, you know, um, funding is often an issue. Uh, and so you have to you have to get creative about that. Uh, of course, you can apply for grants together. You can, um, you know, and here in our, our university, we actually ended up finding a lot of different departments who are willing to donate money. So, um, so, so in working with partners, um, I actually got our director to work with other partners at the university uh, to fund it. Uh, so that's, that, you know, you have to get creative, of course. Um, funding is definitely an issue. Uh, of course, if you're going to have a good partner relationship, it's important to be very clear about what the, uh, what the parameters are, right? Like, so what is, what, what are you doing? What am I doing? Um, what is our goal? How will we achieve it, you know, and through this set of actions, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, some partnerships have fallen apart uh, that way, because, you know, maybe either they didn't understand or I didn't understand or, you know, or uh, sometimes uh, the situation changes, funding gets cut, or, you know, uh, the priorities change. Uh, it does happen. Um, so it's, it really is a matter of just keeping your eyes open because you know not all the all the collaborations are going to be successful, uh, but if you're keeping your eyes open and your mind open, um, you're going to keep finding really great opportunities uh, that you can pursue, and hopefully you know some of them will land. Uh, Evangeline, you had your hand up before. Well, Zach, I just want to express our thanks to you. It was a great presentation. Now Thank we understand why. Outreach is so challenging because we are not trained to do it. Exactly. So anyway, thank you so much for the tips. You're most welcome. Yeah, and that's why I'm so in, uh, insistent that the students in our laboratory volunteer and get experience doing this because, you know, it's, of course, the more they explain their work to uh, an audience that, you know, isn't necessarily trained in that work, uh, the better they understand it themselves, to be honest. Uh, and, but, you know, they're just, their communication skills are going to be better overall. And of course, um, you know, they are inspiring the next generation of nuclear scientists. So like, you just have to have experience, have an opportunity to have that experience. It's important. Yes. Thank you again. I need to jump out to another uh, meeting. That... Take care. Thanks. Thanks Zach. Uh if anyone has any more questions, please put them in the Q&A portion. I've already seen that Zach has been able to respond to some of them over there. He is easily accessible through Whova. You just click on his face right there on the Whova app and then uh, just press message. So um, thank you again, Zach. This was amazing as always. <laughs> uh, let me know if you all need anything. I hope to see you all at the next session, which is how to get editors to publish your story in the news. So um, that is happening in like five seconds. <laughs> so let's see you all there. Thank you. Enjoy.